It's the Poker News Podcast. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 849th episode of the Poker News Podcast. I am Chad Holloway at Level 9 Studio in Las Vegas with Mike Holtz and Kinda England. The World Series of Poker is over, but the drama is not. We have Solvergate. Is that what it's being called? I Solvergate guess so. 2024. Yeah, that's what it's been officially branded as. So let me start by saying this. We addressed a little bit uh, in the last episode, which we caught some flack over. So we talked about the earbud, right? That everyone was saying, oh, there's cheating, the earbud. Look, Solvergate hadn't manifested to the point where it is today. Mm-hmm. The earbud thing was relatively new when we recorded, hence why we didn't we didn't even know about it, so we couldn't address it. But we're going to address it today. Uh, but just so you know, like following up on that, because it's been interesting. Uh, the earbud thing, still, there's still people who are harping on it, but it's pretty clear to me. Like, that is a nothing burger, right? Mm-hmm. It seems yeah, like it seems it. like a nothing burger, yeah. What is the talk of the poker world is the fact that they were using a laptop on the rail, which isn't unusual. This has happened for better part of a decade, really, since yeah. it started streaming. <clears throat> now, I think I had a tweet where I said, you know, I don't really have a problem with this. Be- and that was before I knew they were using solvers. I thought they were doing what I've seen done over the past 10 years. They're watching the stream. They are they are the sure. coaching team. They're going to watch the stream an hour later and then go up and be like, hey, you made a good fold or you made a bad fold or, you know, watch out. He's three betting light. That sort of thing. Sure, right? yeah. Which I don't really have a problem with. In fact, that's what I said. You'd be silly not to have kind of a team that's giving you that. I didn't know they were using solvers, which we learned because there were some pictures taken by spectators that – uh, you know, Dominic Niche was on the rail, Joe McKeon, uh, and they were using solvers to, I don't know if they were doing it, what, if they were watching the streams and inputting it then, if they were doing it kind of more in real time. You well, guys it's, know? it's both, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure, I, I don't know, there's probably no reason for them to look at the stream and then do hands from before to be like, oh, you could have played it this way. I think they're playing for the future, so I think it's more of a... Um, running what type of sizes we're going to be using when the stack depths change and yeah right. preparing for future hands like okay well, uh, we just lost a 30 big blind pot now we're 80 versus 50 bigs you know what i mean now we've got to pull up the 50 big blind things we're looking at c bets of this sizing you know this texture board we're going to do this it's uh, been the talk of the poker world. You had Doug Polk getting Jordan Griff on his podcast, Daniel Negreanu, Alan Keating. We're going to get into that a little bit. Let me ask you both this and i'll start with you kind of like is this cheating? A lot of people think out there that this is. I don't know. It seems like a gray area, of course. Like, they made the announcement early on, you know, no solver use in the tournament area. Like, I'm just going to be honest. Like, I just, I don't care. Like, it really, <laughs> like, just doesn't make a difference. Like, yeah, they're preparing, but, like, it's not like they're running hands in real time. It's not like no, you can are. go. No, I mean, they can't see everybody's cards, though. Like, yeah, maybe they're pulling charts for him to look at, but what's to say he can't just, like, go do that on break himself, you know? So Well, I, that's the, the argument. He maybe could go do that on break, but they're not. They're doing it right there. They're doing it right there. Hands. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it is, like I said, it's just a little bit of a gray area, but it just to me, it's, I don't know. We It's, it's again, again the, the game, right? Not the player. Yeah. Like, he needs to be enforced if it's really a rule. Somebody should have been there. There were lots of people on the rail. Somebody could have said something. Somebody could have said something to the floor. Nobody did. Um, who knows, like, how much they were actually running Sims there, too. You know, maybe they did have the stream up. Maybe they were running old hands. I don't know. Like, nobody really knows unless you talk to them and just people blowing it out of proportion and making it a big deal. It just means that WSOP maybe has to tighten up the rules a little bit. No, that, that's the onus should be on WSOP, I think. Uh, this isn't, uh, you know, just Tamayo doing this. This mm-hmm. is like you look at a lot of final tables and you see this. And it's not just the WS, WSOP. This happened in other places too. I mean, I've seen it everywhere where, you know, people have their boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever or their good friends looking up sp- spots and texting them to them on on hands but yeah something's got to be done i mean it definitely makes a huge difference like uh, i don't know it's it's really really something that the operators have to take on because it's you know until you start giving out the first really serious penalties what's to stop people from doing it I do think it's definitely a gray area for a number of reasons. Number one is there really wasn't anything in the rule book for this year in terms of specifically addressing the solver situation. Now, if you remember towards the beginning of the WSOP, somebody took a picture of somebody on some sort of solver on their phone and it blew up then. And the WSOP issued a statement at that time saying, you know, if you are using these in the tournament area, then you could be subject to a penalty or disqualification. Sure. Right. But that's a statement 
not actually in the rule book for one. Which, so like when you say WSOP needs to tighten stuff up, stuff like that has to tighten up. Also, the other part is this. I'm going to show the video. Kind of you referenced it already. It was a video by James Chen. Uh, this was from, I believe, early June, uh, June 3rd. He tweeted out a video. It's just 14 seconds long. Uh, in it, you it's before the start of a tournament. And you're going to hear a tournament director or a floor person giving the usual announcements. You know, welcome to day one of sure. blah, blah, blah. And in it, they address the solvers saying that if you are using them, uh, you, could, you have the possibility of being disqualified from the tournament. Uh, if you found using them in the turn tournament area, uh, check it out. We do ask you to please do not use any type of poker solvers at any point in time at the table or in the tournament area. If you are found using one of these poker solvers, there's a possibility of being disqualified from this tournament. All right, so there you have it. Daniel Negron, you shared this tweet, and that's when it really caught, fi uh, caught fire. And this has become a big talking point for people who are really, really critical of this whole situation. Now, I don't know two things I want to say. First off, you guys played more poker than I did this summer, but I played three events. And I don't recall this being said at the start of my the three events I played. I'm not saying that it didn't happen. It's very possible that I was just zoned out or what have you. But like, are we sure 100% that this was said at every single event of the WSOP? I don't know if it's every event, but... I heard it once, I, I, but I wasn't there at the start of every single event, so I don't know. But the one event that I was, I heard it, them say it. Yeah, Maybe I wasn't it was that the same start one, of too many, but like... Yeah. I, late Regine, sons of guns. <laughs> yeah, like I was in there for the shootout. They, Yeah, and the main event. They definitely. I mean, I've definitely heard it multiple times, so maybe they said the start of day twos as well. But yeah, I've heard them reference that same deal with vaping in the tournament area. It's mm -hmm. sometimes right. they'll say it, sometimes they don't. Well, it, it, it really all, I, in my opinion, I mean, and I think Daniel Legrand addressed this a little bit too in the podcast, but it stems from like the advancement of technology now. They really just have to cut down kind of on cell phone usage if they want or technology in the tournament area. And you see like some of the dealers will enforce it and be like, no cell phones during the hand, you know, but it, it comes down to a lot more than that. Like now that you can check stuff in between, I don't know, like technology is so advanced like how do you limit somebody from using their phone and didn't they also have a rule that was like i heard something about like no texting your friend at the same table which you I can't have, do that yeah. i know which i have been guilty of doing if my friend is sitting at the table it's not like i'm going to be like this is my hand it's more like where are we going for lunch like or you're stupid why'd you fold there or something you know just like riz razzing my friend i'm not like trying to cheat but i i understood that that was a rule this year and i had a friend sit with me at the table one time and i was like oh yeah and i brought it up but it's like how do we enforce that is somebody going to come up and look at my phone and be like, you texted your friend, you know? So, I don't know. Yeah, no, it is a weird one. Like, what, you can't ask your friends for reads at the table when they sit down? Like, I don't know. I guess, I guess, I guess that, I don't know, is that cheating now? Like, I don't know. It's crazy, right? See, I, and I don't, I don't want to go as far. There's a people out there who are calling them cheaters who legitimately believe that he should be stripped of the title and the money redistributed. Oh, come on. I agree. That's like, absurd. It is absurd. And I think so for this reason is that I don't, it was maybe a step too far, but I don't think it was a step into cheating, right? They were doing this out in the open. Mm -hmm. I don't think they had malicious intent. I think that in their minds, they thought that this was all right. Uh, in years past, like we said, we had seen people watching the streams, uh, coaching, if you will, sure. giving advice in between hands. That has all been pretty standard. But as kind of pointed out now, it's just the technology has advanced so far that it, it became a problem this year. Mm -hmm. It took this one step too far, but not quite one step into what I would deem cheating territory. And so I don't think that stripping him of the title uh, or anything like that is no, should even be, be considered. Right? Yeah. And who wants to win like that, too? Like, I know we're going to talk about the Griff interview in a second, but I felt like listening to that, like, he doesn't want to win like that. Like, I mean, you, you didn't win, man. You know, you got second place. Like, I For would not want For $10 million, wanna... dollars, I will get butt naked <laughs> on national television. <laughs> right was... now, we can set up a mudslide. Fair, a mudslide like... directly into a ramp that launches I... me into something disgusting. Hey, I'm spiders. not greedy. You already have six. You know what I mean? Do you really want to forever be known as the guy who got second place by or got first place by default like you know no I don't want to be uh, I that mean, person and on, the, on the flip side of that though too like look I like Jonathan mm -hmm. Tomeo I've known him for many years I know him to be a nice down to earth guy I don't think he had any uh, idea that this would come of this I don't think he had any um, you know like 
preconceived notion. He was probably caught up in the moment. I mean, he was on exactly. day 10 of the main event at the sure. final table. He went from folding queens and being short stacked to all of a sudden being in this position. He was just trusting his friends, his coaches, his uh, confidential circle, if you will. And I'm sure if somebody had mentioned something to the floor and the floor was like, hey, guys, you can't be doing that. They would have just put it away. You know what I mean? They wouldn't have even done it anymore. Right. Like it's an exciting moment. You know, I, I, I don't know. I think it's just it's becoming a lot. And I, I see both sides of it. But like from my own personal perspective, like, I just don't care. The one thing that I really, uh, well, my point with Samael was going to be like, this is going to mar, the, right? This is going to be a stain on the yeah. wind, no matter what, to a certain degree, to a certain yeah, degree, right? A, I guess. Oh, like, it's a massive are, stain, I yeah. think. I, 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 just, I just don't see it that way. I just don't, I mean, just, I don't see it as such a, a big deal. I don't know. Maybe that's just me, though. I mean, it, I, oh, I, I don't mean like necessarily from like me personally thinking it was a huge it, deal he did that or not. I just mean like if you look go at, down in history, if you like, look, yeah. everyone's going to look at the band and they're going to be like, oh, yeah, the guy that you, yeah. you know what I mean? Like Barry that's Bonds with the home run. Right. They look yeah. back at the I see what you mean and, there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it just, it just is mm. what it is. You know what I mean? So one of the reasons I think this is a really big gray area, and I've engaged a little bit on social media, is this. Everyone says, well, they made this in the video, right? They made these announcements, or even if it's in the rule book or in their statement, that you can't use solvers at the table or in the tournament area. Okay. I've been doing the WSOP for 16 years. Precedent would say they consider the tournament area to be inside the ropes, mm -hmm. right? So on break, they say, please exit the tournament area. All they're asking is for you to go on the rail to the other side of the ropes. Oh, no, I disagree because they, they call that whole room the tournament area because they say if you vape in the tournament area, you get a penalty. And I asked them what they consider the tournament area, and they said anything up until those doors right there. See, and okay, and then that's fair in that regard. But then again, they've given a mixed message when they say, please exit the tournament area on a break, and they sure. just expect you to be on the other side of the ropes, right? Right. This yeah, is that's, where, true. that's true, This too, is yeah. where the WSOP really just needs to uh, buckle down. Obviously, this is a situation. The whole poker world's talking about it. There seems to be very firm agreements across all the spectrums. Like, okay, well, this you, can't if, happen if again. If you would have asked me before this and said, like, hey, do you think it's legal for us to pull up solvers on the rail? I'd be like, no, you can't do that. That's illegal. You can't use solvers. Like, I th Then I think it's very obvious. Right. I think... You know, there, there's – and Negron, you said it. We're going to show some clips too from the interview he did with Doug Polk here in a minute. Like it doesn't – it's not quite cheating. He doesn't consider it cheating. I don't either and I don't think a lot of people do. But it does cross into that, like I said, that one step too far into maybe unethical territory. Mm -hmm. And they might not even – like I don't think they realized it in real time. I don't think Dominic Nietzsche, based on his replies no, it seemed on like social he, media, it doesn't no, seem he's, like I don't know about him, dog. <laughs> I don't know. His, his replies on social media were really uncool, I thought. I thought he came off super bad and kind of like – arrogant, egotistical. You he know. could have been a little more apologetic about it, like, you know, but yeah, you're Oof. right. <laughs> a <laughs> little more apologetic. Yeah. Oof. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. He said some weird stuff. He anyway. doubled down. He was doubled down. down. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me say this real fast before we go in the clip it, uh, for viewers at home. Like when, when the reason why the solvers is so, is so bad for them to use and so advantageous is because when you look at a lot of these spots where there's five people, six people left, three people left, whatever it is, the stack size is changing, changes everything. And it's very hard for a human to know, okay, when this guy has this many chips and this guy, and calculate all that, what your specific ranges are. So them being able to use a computer to be able to tell exactly what sort of things they should be doing. There's things I'll see all the time that I'm like, oh, that's surprising. I would have thought this spot was totally different. So if they have that aid right there and then, I mean, I don't know. It, it's 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 a big deal, like, yeah. as far as heads up, not so much. You're, I mean, yeah, heads up, you, you should probably know your strategy. It's just pre-flop charts, yada, yada, and looking over some hands. But before then, when it's, you know, three-plus people and the stack sizes are differing, it, it makes a huge deal as far as your your ability to play certain hand classes. Right, so Negranu had a great analogy, and he likened it to chess in this regard. Of So if you, they were using a solver after watching a hand on the stream, the hand is over, and they're just doing like a post-mortem, right? And hand sure. analysis, yep. right, to learn from, which I think anybody kind of understands that. We, we do that, right? We play. Right. Reasonable. Yeah, we play a tournament, we bust, we go think about what happened, maybe we talk about it, run through a solver. But what's happening here, apparently, is what Mike just described of, you know, they have the situation, here's the data, put it into the computer, and then the computer spits out, here's what you should do, right? And Negranu likened it to chess of, all right, if Kaina and I are playing chess, the chess board is laid out upon us. As a player, I should be thinking, what am I going to do? Oh, hold on a second. Let me put it into the computer, which sure. has solved it. And it will tell me that I need to move my rook to the spot, right? And mm -hmm. like clearly that's yep. unfair. That is real-time assistance as opposed to after a hand is complete. And I think that is where the big 
issue lies. And I, and I do see that as being an issue, but I do see it as um, being in that gray area according to what the WSOP had set up, right? Sure. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think until the WSOP – uh, puts a foot down, says we're not doing this shit anymore. Like no solvers, no preflop charts, no any of that. You get caught anywhere in the area with a picture or a foreman sees you, you're DQ'd from the tournament immediately. Yada yada. Yeah, and they they're gonna have to right. This they probably big... will, don't they? They usually do react to pre- like previous seasons, you know, and make changes, and they learn as they go. And so I bet. I mean, I'm I don't know, but I'm. I bet that next year they do come out with some tighter regulations around it. I think it'll be sooner than that. I think they'll do it. Uh, so the first thing they need to do is figure out, okay, what are we going to do? Mm-hmm. How do we make this legal, right? Because you have to put it in the rules and make it legal. So, uh, th- so like, I can understand why they haven't said anything yet because they need to get their ducks in a row. But I think they're going to do it before WSOP Paradise, which is at the end of the year sure. in December, which, which we'll talk about. Um, I want to talk about... Jordan Griff, because he was probably the one most affected by this, right? He was the one who took second place. Sure, yeah. Um, and he was the one who went on Doug Polk's show. I'm going to show two clips here real quick. Uh, this was a longer interview. You can check out the whole uh, interview that Jordan Griff did with Doug Polk on his YouTube channel. We're just going to show two quick uh, clips to give you a taste of it and also to discuss it a little bit. You're going to hear uh, what Jordan Griff thought about it, if he would do anything differently, knowing what he knows now, and then if he's considering any legal action Check them out. Going back to this, though. So if you knew what was going on over there on, on Tamayo base camp, would you have done anything differently? Oof, that's a good question. If I had like 100% confirmation that they were there running Sims, um, I may have mentioned something to the floor then and said like, hey, is that allowed? Is this something they can do? Um, but like, you know, I was just trying to enjoy the moment. I wasn't trying to damper it and, you know, I would ass- I was assuming that you know WSOP would be enforcing you know, any rules that they have in place and you know monitoring that. Well, that that assumption might have been yeah. <laughs> might have been a little bit uh, a little bit off there because <laughs> it it is weird to me. I went through and I checked all of the rules here and I looked at the Nevada gaming thing and um, as far as the 2024 rule set goes, I know they made that announcement over the intercom several times. And there's a couple provisions in there that are maybe loosely apply, but I didn't see any real strongly worded anti, you know, solver stuff other than that announcement. Um, so it does kind of seem like they've put themselves in a little bit of a gray area here where all of a sudden you have the biggest possible situation for this you can have and you've not really done anything with this rule. And then you're thinking, oh, shit, what do we do here? I don't know, like... Sh- what would have been the appropriate response from the World Series of Poker in in your eyes? In the moment, if they had seen it, it's, it's they, dude. They have, they have cameras everywhere, man. Yeah. They've got a, yeah. like. There's no way. There's no way they're just sitting here. He was front row at the <laughs> final table of the main event, and you're like, oh, like, there's no way they know. Like, this. Yeah. Where where else are you watching right now? Like, this is the only place anyone's watching. I don't understand. They had to know. I, I would assume. Yeah, I mean, I would guess that they probably would have given them a warning and said, put it away. And then if it comes out again, like maybe some sort of penalty. But I, I don't foresee that they would have really enforced that rule, especially given the, the vagueness of, you know, it wasn't in the rule book or, you know, they made an announcement where it said you could be penalized. It seemed like, you know, people throughout the series had taken photos of people looking at solvers on their phone. And it was like, you know, just, hey, put it away. Um, so it didn't seem like it was, you know, this like, oh, if you have a solver, we're kicking you out, we're disqualifying you, is more just like, you know, don't do it, and we're going to warn you if you, you pull it out. So th- that's just me speculating, but I would have guessed that they would have told them to cut it out. Is that something that you're going to take a look at and explore? I mean, if you feel like they actually violated the, the, the rules of the state for gaming to do this, is that something you would be willing to explore, or is that something you're just, you know, not going to go down that path? Um, I would leave it open. I mean, it's not like I would pursue it and be like, wow, if they disqualify him, I'm the main event champion. Like, you know, he, he won the heads up battle, whether he got assistance or not. Um, I didn't even think about that, but you're right. If they DQ'd him, I guess you win, right? Uh, yeah, I don't even know. But like, I, 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 <laughs> that was my first thought seeing like people in the Twitter comments all about that. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's a lot to think about. And I haven't really looked into the laws. I haven't spoken to anyone from a legal team. Um, 
So, you know, I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's open or shut, but it's just something I haven't really had time yet to, to even consider. So once you have had that time, if there was a case, would you consider filing a suit? I would say it's always a possibility, but I'm not, you know, I'm not sure at this time. All right, there it is. I don't know, kind of, what did you think? I thought Jordan Griff came, I, I didn't know what he was going to do when he went and did that interview. Sure. And I, I was, I was pleasantly surprised at how well-spoken and put together he was. Yeah, about he it seemed all. pretty mellow about it. was just kind of like, I don't know, man, you know, like if I knew maybe I would have said something to the floor, you know, I, that's the same mentality I have too. If it was me sitting there, I don't know what I would have done. I, and like, hey, man, can those guys be doing that over there? You know, like, what else are you supposed to do? Like, uh, and legal action? Oh, come on. Uh. Yeah, no legal actions happening. That's ridiculous. <laughs> a lot of people think that there should be. And, uh, yeah, why do you think it's ridiculous? I do, too, by the way. I think it's ridiculous. I mean, I mean it's how, like, happen, what, but... what, what are we even talking Like, it, it's, you, you're playing by the tournament's rules when you enter the tournament. It's yeah. the WSP's discretion, not anybody else's. They're ruled by the Gaming Commission. Good luck beating the gaming commission, yada yada. It's just, it's not never going to. The judge would laugh that out of court, yeah. right? I mean, it, it would be hard to like. Who are you going to sue first, right? You're going to sue Tomeo or the WSOP yeah. or both, right? Mm -hmm. Good luck. Uh, you know, you're going to spend a fortune in legal fees. That is probably going to be. Yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and plus you got to prove somehow damages, right? You're going to teach gonna, the judge about poker. Or the yeah. you know what are we doing here? It's we, look, 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 look what <laughs> happened, like with Mike Posso when that went to court, it, and they it, tried it, to. That's exactly what I was going to say. Was we, we had indisputable evidence against Posso and yeah. judge. Just like, I don't know what's me, Boca. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think, I mean, he might look into it. Who knows? I don't think it would be very successful. I think the biggest thing that can come out of this now is change. I do think that will happen. I do think it's been a big conversation all across the poker spectrum from top pros to recreational players. I've seen on social media and Facebook groups people who are really turned off by this, mm -hmm. you know, who – you know, it's such a bad look, Yeah, man. especially older players. Like, they feel like, I can't compete with that. I don't even, why even bother anymore? And that's not what we need in the game right now. It's bad optics. Like, it Yeah, just no, say, it's terrible optics. But there are, I mean, okay, and I don't want to sound like a dum-dum, and I'm probably going to come off sounding like a dum-dum, but, like, the solvers are, like, meant to play against the solvers, really, in, like, optimal play. And not everybody plays like that, you know? So it's still reactionary. There are still some really great players out there that don't do any solver work and that just play a certain way and, you know— um, then they go with their gut or intuition or tells, you know, just different things or different ways to play. Not everything is just generated by a computer and it does not run the game. Like not everybody does that. Well, you, you can do a thing with solvers called node locking where, where you take the ranges that you think your opponent will play and you can fix them into, you know, they're going to be, we think they're going to be too wide with preflop. We think they're going to be uh, overfolding to C bets, you know, whatever, you know, you could change so the range. studying different player types and different player well, personalities. Yeah, I, I, can, I can input, you know, if I, if I watched you play, yeah. you know, whatever amount of hands, a million hands or whatever, I could input, you, I could make a Kina in the solver and be like, this is how <laughs> we're going to play against Kina and it's going to be pretty damn oh my accurate. God, could you? I want to see solver <laughs> Kina and how she does. She's losing about eight big blinds per <laughs> 100, unfortunately. Solver kind of doesn't drink yeah, all yeah, the wine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We either should be a, a solver kind of before the wine and a solver kind of after the wine because those are two completely different kinds. She just like is pure GTO crusher <laughs> on the wine. And yeah, no, no, like wine kind of is like, I hate this guy's face. I'm all in. <laughs> no, that's an effective tactic. Uh, two of the top uh, names in poker joined Doug Polk. I'm talking about Daniel Negreanu and Alan Keating. Now, they had a, about an hour and 45 minute conversation about the topics that we're discussing here. And, you know, Negreanu's got a big voice. He's got a lot of power in this industry. He's calling for change, so I think that's going to be a good thing. Alan Keating brought a nice perspective, right, because we know him from, like, Hustler Casino Live, the big cash games. He's not much of a tourn tournament player. So he brought a perspective of, like, hey, this is what it looks like from the outside looking. Sure, in. yeah. And uh, I thought it was a good conversation. I think Doug did a good job. I'm going to show, again, two clips from this. They're a, a few minutes each. We'll run them back to back. Uh, the first one is uh, just talking about how laptops used to be viewed, right? So why wasn't a laptop on the rail like a big red flag? Sure. Because precedent says like people are just watching the streams there. It wasn't that far out of the norm. Uh, and then also advocating for clear, harsher rules, which we've kind of described. Uh, and then Alan K uh, Keating talks about uh, what I think is an interesting point a lot of people have harped on. It's like poker is supposed to be an individual game. When you have a rail like that, the coaching, the solvers, like it's all of a sudden like a team sport, right? And yeah. A lot of people don't like that. The way I look at that, though, well, let's play the clip. Yeah. Check it out. I, 
uh, given the announcements WSB was making over the intercom and given where we're at on this whole solver thing, if I saw a laptop on the rail, what I would assume is he's got the stream up. Yeah. You know, he's got the and stream up important. and, and nothing, nothing wrong with that. That's uh, I think I, I don't, I don't well, know. There's anymore. precedent we've had for a decade. We've seen that. So like everyone talking about laptops, you know, you see photos of Sean Deeb and then the history, everyone's got the laptop up because they're watching the stream. That was always kosher. So you know, I think a lot of flack going to the World Series of Poker's ways un unwarranted because, like, that's been the norm. You know, like people have always done that. And the only th the only step that wasn't taken was anyone looking closely and saying, "Okay, can I see your screen?" Right? That wasn't done. And and the question is, should we? And how can we? And you know, at at what is this? At three tables? At five? What about on day two? On day three? Like, you know, it's it's um it becomes a slippery slope. So like, I believe you know the best approach personally is just to have a harsh rule on none of this stuff being open at any point in a tournament area. And if you're caught on, in a, as a spectator, you're removed from the place. And if you're caught as a player, you, you face penalty of, you know, what Alan yeah. said, which is two rounds or potentially, you know, a full DQ. I like that. We're going to go with Alan's take on. Yeah. What the tournament penalty <laughs> like. All right. We, we came together. I am not. And, 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 and Alan, Alan has spoken. It will be a two orbit <laughs> penalty. Moving forward. I, I kind of well, like it actually, because it is brutal. Like that's it should you know, be I said that originally, if you have 13 bigs and you have to go through two lives, now you have eight. You, that's like pretty bad. So, you know, if you want to look at your, you know, yeah. your, all, your push your fold charts, like under the gun, realize that you might just have to, Go through two but, sets of lines. Making, so just, to, just to go. Oh, sorry, Alan. Go ahead. Just, hey, you're making a lot of good points. Let me just throw this in there. Is that another thing? Is the World Series is already as far as like final table or whatever. They're already incentivized to police this, have this rule, and police this rule because there are people that won't go to this next main event because of what they saw that time. Right? They're pulling a lot of rake out of this tournament. It's not a big ask to get someone on there full time is that that their job in my opinion yeah and, and that's a shame and you're right i've seen that on twitter too a lot of people saying well i'm never gonna i was gonna play i'm never gonna play and i hope that's not the case right because i think like if anything okay. generally speaking when there is a robbery right like robbers don't go right back to that you know same same house like this is an opportunity to go okay well we saw it happen and we're gonna do everything we can to you know secure it so that next time you know it doesn't and i do think the conversations are happening all all over the place whether it's matt savage and his crew, the World Series of Poker internally, like they're going to get this nailed down. So obviously it seems like most of the public is against him here, but maybe there are more people that support this than we think that are just being quiet. How do we know that there aren't contingents of people that think this kind of behav behavior is actually okay? Um, so I, I guess the, the data point we have is that poker news poll, right? They, they wrote an article about it and I think it was 3,500 people voted. Um, you know, whether they thought it was, um, they liked or disliked it. And I think 86% people said they disliked the help. 3% had no opinion and 11% had no issue because, and this is the important part because it broke no rules. Right. So if you had a rule there that says it, it's not allowed, like what that 11%, I wonder how small that would get. I, I, I don't think that there's a good argument on the other side maybe you you want like hyper competitiveness um and and like any tool helps it but I, I don't really see that argument being made other than it's not illegal yet you know yeah i, I think one example that gets thrown around a lot we're like oh this is like football and the coach they're coaching him up on the side it's fundamentally different than football or sports because in sports the really difficult part is executing the play you drew up, right? Like, okay, here's the play. All right, yeah, now just go out against all these world-class athletes and execute your play to score. You know, you guys got this. Like, that's the hard part, you know? Whereas in poker, the hard part is figuring out what that play is because the actual execution is you take the chips, you put them in there, you know, and then you sit yeah. there for a while. Yeah, I think the closer comparable is chess, right? So discussing a chess move with friends is like, okay, already not okay, but like, actually just going to the rail and getting an engine to say what the next move is, right? That's essentially what it is, right? Like, cause so there's an example. Yeah. So for yeah, example, what, yeah, what, what happened with Doug, right? If you're under the gun with seven big lines, okay? You can literally look up the correct GTO answer. Now you have the answer before the question's been asked. Now that's why when I sort of argue about real time, it's going to help you in real time. You're gonna get the 100% correct answer in real time 
by, by doing this. And you couldn't do that in chess. You shouldn't be able to do that in poker. Everyone knows that this, this, this did break a rule too. Again, the problem with the rule is it was kind of flimsy and it, you know, just doing an announcement prior. The problem was the written rule wasn't clear enough. Okay. And part of that was, again, this is all new. This sort of conversation came up when there was the guy right before the series started, you know, who got caught, you know, at the table doing this and sort of, they oh, came yeah. up with one on the spot. Right. So it's new, but I think now, like, with the amount of eyeballs and listen, it's, it spawns so many bad mainstream stories. We got the earpiece. Oh my God, fell out of his ear. And they're like all the, it's like, you know, we live in a world now where conspiracies fly and it spawned just a whole bunch of negative attention for the game. All right. So there you have it. I thought it was a good discussion. I encourage you to go check out the whole YouTube video on Doug Polk's YouTube channel. Um, I, I get what they're saying. Uh, I, I do think poker should be more one-on-one, -on -one, not an individual or uh, rather like a coached, you know, a team sport. Yeah. It would be really disappointing if they went ahead and made a change to eliminate rails as a reaction to this, though. I think that would just be really disappointing. Well, let me ask you this. Like, uh, okay, what are – we're saying things need to change. How do they need to change? One of, my, one of the things that have been suggested is like maybe bringing back a November 9 type thing. Or to make the final table more uh, secluded, mm -hmm. push the rail back further. Yeah, or, that's the one, I think. I think I do like the idea of putting it in like what it used to be the Penn and Teller Theater. So the main stage was up on the stage and then the, you had the whole audience in the crowd. Like the WPT. Yeah. Yeah. And so like you couldn't have players going to the rail in between every single hand. And I got to tell you from an not only optics in terms of what we're seeing, you know, going to a laptop, just from a viewer experience, there were so many hands during the WSOP main event final table where there's like an all in and all of a sudden all the players were gone from the table yeah. because they went to their rails. Uh, you know, like I kind of miss the days of everybody just keep your ass in your sure, seat yeah. and play some poker. That could be a good role. Like, I mean, you have to stay at your seat, you know? I don't know. Like, you, I mean, it's no fun, like, to not be able to go over and, like, hug your rail. But, like, you could still cheer. They still can see. They can still root for you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing that I do like, I don't know if this will ever happen, but I actually do like the idea of it is uh, to bring a little GG twist into maybe the main event final table, maybe all WSOP final tables. I don't know, but you know what GG does when you make a final table? Like the moving of seats and everything? Yeah, so it's not a preconceived, uh, you know, here's the seating assignment. It is once the final table is set, the smallest stack has to pick their seat first. Then the next stack has to go pick theirs all the way up to the chip leader who can then pick wherever they want. Right? So we did that in Game of Gold too. Like yeah. uh, they, they let me, I was short a stack. They let me pick. I'm like, does it even matter where I pick? Like I'm just going to be shuffled around. But yeah, yeah, I don't actually understand fun. what like um what the what's the point of that again? Well, I mean, if, if, if especially if there's a delay, like even in the day in between, like how do you, it makes studying for it harder a mm -hmm. little bit, right? It keeps the little more randomness. Oh, because you don't know where you're going to sit until that day. Right. Yeah. Okay, you, that's interesting yeah so you you know you can't uh it's hard to develop a strategy against the short but stacks GG or big does stacks it. it's like you, you know but gg i mean it's just like i'm playing it's like -da, you've made it and yeah. it's like i right, pick your shit brother you know what i mean it's like well, well why are they doing that why not just randomize it mm, they're giving know. an advantage to the chip leaders right? yeah, yeah they are but like if there's time in between Ooh, i guess it that's would... why i mean there is an incentive then to try to yeah. get you're, a chip you're lead, incentivized right? to try to accumulate more chips yeah. which eventually acquires that, more rake which acquires more gamble which acquires <laughs> 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 yeah. now imagine like the main event goes back to having a delay like a november 9 a few months in between which i like just from a media perspective it gives us more time to get to know these players tell their story yeah have a little more invested interest um they can have family fly in and things i i do think there's something to that um but also imagine going those three months not knowing like the seating assignments yeah. or how that's going to play out and they should just do it to the final tables of paradise I mean, test it out somewhere. I, I think it'd be worth uh, at least giving it a go at, well, yeah, one of the GG uh, final tables in Paradise or the GG flip and go or something like that. No, no, I, I meant uh, for the main event. They should do main event final table at Paradise. The first the first event of the series is the final table and you all get to watch it in a big arena or whatever it is or something like that. I guess maybe not, though. Who yeah. knows? I don't know. I'm spitballing. <laughs> well, I think one thing we can all agree on is that this is going to lead to some sort of change, needs to lead to some sort of change. I don't foresee this... Uh, you know, it's in, it's happened. It's in the past. I think I don't, I don't anticipate that there's going to be any repercussions, any consequences, any legal action. 
I could be wrong. Sure. I just don't think that's going to be the case. Uh, I would like to hear from the WSOP when they're ready. I'd like to hear from maybe Jonathan Tomeo, um, Dominic Niche. We've heard from hasn't been pretty. As I said, you said he like he doubled down. He went on the defensive. Um, I do think some sort of humility needs to be. Yeah, and, there's a know, level of arrogance there that is right. Even if you corny when you're doing it and you didn't think it was wrong, and I don't think they did think what they were doing was wrong. I, I think they honestly believed it was okay. It's okay to, after the fact, look and be like, okay, I can see, you, of know, course. you know, I can see the arguments. Maybe this wasn't. And, you know, sorry about that. Like, uh, it won't, yeah. you know, these sort of things. Which is a totally reasonable again. thing. Sometimes you, you know, maybe play an event you, you, you regret afterwards. And then you say, I'm sorry to the community. I won't play that event again. You know, <laughs> uh, no particular instance I'm thinking about, you, you know, but. Lessons are learned, right? Like, yeah. wasn't there a time in online poker, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago where like, Go, uh, ghosting or multi-accounting wasn't like the egregious, uh, you know, situation I that think it is so, now. But I'm not really sure. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, just I things, wasn't in the game then. Things change, right? You, you know, over the years, and this is just another one of those opportunities because it has opened up such a discussion. All right, let's put a pin in that and turn our attention to the Jeremy Becker, Landon Tice cross book that was going to be all the rage this summer. Two crushers, they're killing it this summer. They both made <laughs> a bunch of money, right? Yeah, I mean, it was the <laughs> uh, the child of the sim versus the live reads, Jeremy yeah. Becker. Um, there was a um, tweet from Negranu about it at the beginning of the series, kind of asking for... You know, who who thought was going to get the the bigger who who who's going to win this? Mm-hmm. Right. So it was a cross book. Basically, correct me if I'm wrong. Too, uh, they were both going to play essentially the same amount of buy in, same same events, and whoever was up more, the other person's going to owe him the difference. Right. So that's it, how it started. Yeah, I don't know if it changed or how what happened. All my bets were just like straight up. So. Well, it was just if one person won a dollar more, that was the winner. You know. Right. I, I, I don't know what everybody did. Or well, lost a dollar less. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, or or lost a dollar less. Yes, well, Jesus, it was an interesting uh, fight in terms of neither of them did much this summer. In fact, uh, Landon Tice ended up losing eighty eight thousand eight hundred seventy nine dollars. <laughs> oh yeah, and Jeremy Becker only lost seventeen thousand one hundred thirty seven dollars. A good summer. There was a point where they misreported it too, and like Landon went from like minus sixty. K to like plus 88 K and like they put it out there on Twitter and he responded and he's like my need to minus two. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. <laughs> but even though they both lost money, Becker is going to win this one because he was up $61,000. Like that's the difference. So yeah. that is what Landon Tice and Matt Berkey who, you know, had his back and it was kind of Jeremy Becker and Daniel Negreanu, you know, that was the the difference. So, so I mean, did Berkey owe Negreanu 60? So I think, I mean, yeah, Some, mm. somebody owes somebody there. Plus, there were all sorts of side bets, I'm so sure. So much side action. Yeah. Everybody I know has action on that. Yeah, it, it, it was interesting because there was going to be so much action, but everybody thought it was actually going to be like, right, who's going to win? win more? Yeah, who's going to win 500K and who's going to win <laughs> 350K? It just uh, really shows that you have two really big crushers there competing the entire summer and how hard it is to make your way through that many people. You know, like, I think Jeremy Becker did make, like, a good final table at the end, right? Like, he yeah. got, like, the Venetian uh, mystery bounty or something like that. But it's just it's so massive. Even, like, the really, really good players, you have trouble. You struggle. Good was, effort, guys. It's, like, really hard to have a winning summer. Yeah. It was uh, back in February that Negreanu tweeted, and he put a poll of who do you think was going to win. Uh, 36.5% said Landon Tice, 63.5% Jeremy Becker, and looks like the majority uh, won out there, Mm. technically. Yeah, the squares won. (laughs) Uh, We'll have to wait and see. I'm sure we haven't heard the last of Becker or Tice. They're both here in Vegas and will no doubt be crushing. Uh, They just didn't do it at the WSOP. Um, I I think I saw somewhere, too, like Berkey said on on OnlyFriends on the show that uh, altogether he lost somewhere in the neighborhood of like 150K. 150, yeah. Yeah. He tweeted that, I think, too. (laughs) <laughs> well, I want to give a thanks, uh, quick thanks to one of our sponsors, and that is 888 Poker. Uh, they are in the midst of their champion chips games, which is happening right now on 888 Poker. It actually will be finished by the time this airs, but it's just another one of the great series that 888 has. They have their XL Spring Series, XL Winter, all that. And they also do a lot of great content. Uh, they just released a 888 Ride 
with David Tuckman, so he drives around. Oh yeah, and has I saw a guest. this. Yeah, yeah, they did Jesse Lonis. Jesse and, Lonis um, is the newest one. Who else do they do? No, somebody else is newer. Oh, they, isn't there? they had Negranu. They've done it for years. They did somebody else recently that I saw that I was surprised. About. I'm going to send Tuck because uh, I play fantasy football with him. Okay, and I'm going to say he's got to get one of you guys in there next <laughs> time. Yeah, no, 100. percent Let me ride with Tuck. He'd be uh, smoking up his his car yeah, there. Uh, yeah, sure. hot boxing with young <laughs> Tuck and some wine, please. Too. <laughs> there you yeah. go. No, we could go three way ride. Requirements. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about uh, the World Series of Poker Paradise. We already mentioned it a little bit. It's coming up in December, uh, December 6th through the 9th. We talked about it in last week's episode, so we won't get into that uh, those details. What I do want to talk about was the fact that the winner of last year's WSOP Paradise, the 2023 WSOP Paradise main event, was won by Stanislav Ziegel. He was an online qualifier. He won it for $2 million. Mm-hmm. He had a beautiful bracelet, this, you know, first ever WSOP Paradise main event bracelet. And he decided that he was going to list it online to try to raise money for charity. Um, oh, well, that's nice. I thought it was the opposite. No, no. He, you know, he thought he was just trying I to get a bankroll. I thought he was trying to sell it. Like. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, he was, he was trying to uh, sell it and raise money for charity. Uh, he had it listed for $17,500. This was the reserve price on it, I believe. It ended with no bids <laughs> for seventeen. I mean, how much is it worth? Like, really? I mean, I actually would have to do a little. Like, what's the bracelet look like? I mean, it's pretty. Uh, you can kind of see it here. It's like a, a oh, nice, nice looking. Scoot the way, yeah, it's it's yeah. scooting more my way. It's better than the uh, you know your run of the mill bracelets. <laughs> it's a main event bracelet. That's so I'm sure the main event bracelet for the WSOP Paradise. <laughs> So there's like you, diamonds the main, main in there. The main one was a lot fancier. It was a lot yeah, bigger. way yeah. way fancier. But, but it was a smaller event. So what do you guys think about that though? Like there was a time where like I think it was Peter. I'd Eastgate. sell my bracelet for seventeen five right now. Well, yours is an online bracelet, so seventeen hundred seventeen hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> sure, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> no, like there was a time Peter Eastgate, you know, two thousand eight main event champion. Sold his bracelet, main event bracelet for charity, and got like a hundred k for it. Oh, that wow. makes way more sense. Right, I thought they were worth more than that, actually. Well, and we see them coming up on. Wasn't uh, Espen's worth almost like half a million or something crazy? Yeah, like with the diamonds and the gold. This shit and, was bust down. <laughs> it, uh, bracelets, the market is just kind of falling out of them, right? I just did. A, well, they're not as good as they used to. I've seen Jeff Madsen's old ones; they're beautiful. Like they're that's like true. really nice, and now the ones you get now are like. Well, this is an old one, right? I mean, technically, the one that I have from 2013 was made by uh, Jason of Beverly Hills. No, that one looks very nice. Very high-end jeweler. They've done the Super Bowl rings for the Rams when they won. And now the bracelets are done by Jostens. So much nicer than the one I have. Jostens is, you know, they do the high school class rings. Not not too much of a knock, but like between a private Mm. designer, right, out of Beverly Hills or Jostens, you know, there is a quality difference there. Um, I will say Jostens online player of the earrings that I have two of. (laughs) They're beautiful, gorgeous stuff. Well, these uh, bracelets nowadays I hear through the rumor mill, like just on pure gold sort of situation is worth like 1500 bucks. Yeah, they're like 12 I think with like tax write off is 1275 or something like that. There you go, right. So, and then there is uh, like providence to them, right? Like, so... If a bracelet is won in an online event or in a casino employees event, not going to be worth as much as, say, in the 25K PLO. I mean, that's just right. Yeah, I guess. Or if it's one of Eric Seidel's 10 bracelets or Mm, or something like that. Maybe something like that. Yeah. Um, You know, like, you know, no cut on uh, Stanislav Ziegel. Uh, He, he, you know, did you know who he was? If I asked you who the main event winner of the WCA was. Stanislav Siegel? Yeah, of course. Out of Germany, That's my dog, yeah. yeah. That's my (laughs) No, I met him in Argentina one time. We backpacked together for, I think, four or five months. Lots of... (laughs) Wild times. But, you know, if this was, uh, you know, say Daniel Negreanu, I bet you this bracelet sells yeah, you yeah, probably would. Yeah, yeah, quite yeah. a bit. I agree. Uh, it's just interesting because, like, I did an interview with David Sklansky recently. He's got two 1982 WSOP watches. It was the year that they did watches instead of bracelets. Okay. And he wants to sell them. They only had 14 of these ever made, and he owns two of them. I only know where two other ones are. Billy Baxter has two. He says he, he thinks he has them at home. The rest are are kind of lost to time. Do they count as bracelets? Yeah. They, they, but they're actually bracelet. watches. They're watches. They're worth more than a bracelet in terms of actual gold and stuff. They, yeah. were, they cost the WSOP, the Binions, more to make them. But, like, he he took them to uh, Pawn Stars, and he's made, made it out there. If anybody's listening and wants to buy them, they're for sale, and I can put you in touch with him. He's trying to get 50000 for the pair. Mm. And these are, like, some of the most rare 
WSOP memorabilia bracelets ever. And Skolansky is a fairly big name, right? He He's written books, uh, 18 different books, I think. He changed the game with the theory of poker or what have you back in the, the 70s and going into the 80s. So, like, he's a, a pretty big name, but he's not really getting any takers on these as far as I know. So, I don't know. That it just seems like we talk about the devaluing of the bracelets because there's so many of them nowadays. And you're kind of seeing it here in terms of, like, Nobody really wants to buy one. Yeah. I bought a WSOP circuit ring once. Yeah, no, I'm familiar. Yeah? Yeah, you're my, if I ever go broke, I'm going to start slinging you circuit rings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was at the WSOP in Potawatomi in mm-hmm. Milwaukee, which I know you've been to. Uh, That's where I won my ring. There you go. My only one ring. And John's son won the PLO event, and he was walking by, and I said, hey, John, and I knew him, you know, from playing with oh, him. I said, John's son, you yeah. know, congrats on winning the ring. He's like, oh, I don't care. I'm like, what do you mean you don't care? You just want a ring. He's like, ah, I just wanted the money. I'm like, you don't even want the ring? And he's like, no. And I'm like, well, you want to sell it? And uh, he's like, I don't know, how much? <laughs> I'm like, well, how much you want for it? He's like, give me 200 bucks. I said, sold. That's and I gave fun. him 200 bucks, and then I sold it to my boss for 400 <laughs> at the time in, wow. in, in the UK because he, he wanted it for his collection, so – Doubled my money. Hey, um, Wait a second. Do I need to sling my circuit rings? <laughs> oh, no, I guess not. Not yet. Well, you're not going to get a ton uh, if this uh, this auction was any indication. It, like, it was for well, charity, too. Well, you're slinging $400 and, circuit know. rings. I, I can get 500 <laughs> for mine. I'm thinking I got a main event ring. Yeah, I'm looking at, you know, $3,000 worth of rings there. Um, we got to sell those things. That's fair. All right. Well, WSOP Paradise, December 6th through the 19th, as I mentioned. Uh, we'll have to wait and see if the WSOP makes any announcements, solver talk or that, uh, if Stanislav tries to sell this bracelet again or, or, or whatnot. But I thought it was interesting to bring up because uh, you know, bracelets are going unsold on the market right now. Uh, let's talk about something that's going to debut in about a week, a little less than a week, especially when this episode comes out, and that is season 13 of High Stakes Poker. Talked a little bit about it in last season, but neither of you watched it. Are you going to watch it this year, this this season, so we can at least talk about these All million right. dollar hands? Um, did I not watch it last season? No, no. You're I sure? Think I that? watched a little I bit mean, of it when Jennifer know. Tilly was on it. I watched it. It's like all about who's playing. Like I don't really care sometimes. You know, it's like if somebody I want to watch is playing and it's going to be entertaining, then I'll watch it. But we'll see. Well, I can tell you that Jennifer Tilly is slated to be back, Yay. which will be exciting. Phil Helmuth, Andrew Robel, Chamath Palapatia, and Nick Airball are the names that have been announced. They're going to play 200, 400, or 500 in 1,000 no limit hold'em. Oh, that sounds fun. I it, like Andrew Robel, too. He's fun to watch. I like Robel, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that lineup doesn't sound very fun. Mm. I mean, that's just going to be one of the, you know, the many. You know, there's going to be about 13 episodes, I think, is what they usually do, something like that. Uh, AJ Benza and Nick Schulman are going to be back in the commentary booth. And uh, I don't know, last season was pretty good. There were some really big pots. Andrew Robel, like, ran like God. Like, he's a great he's player so as it is, too, but, man, yeah. he just he runs it, so well. I think it's, like, really edited now, though, too, isn't it? Like, they don't just show it. Like, I like the streams where you can just watch all of it. Like, you can watch the whole game from start to finish. And when they edit it so heavily like that, it's like, well, what are we missing? Like, I don't know. It just feels forced. See, but I'm still going to watch it. I, I see. I like the. I, I think there's an argument to be made, right? There's people who love to sit and watch live streams for six hours. There are other people who like the old W WSOP ESPN edited one hour episodes, which sure. these are more like. And so I see the benefits of both. Yeah, I it's really, like if you like TV versus if you just kind of like noise or podcast. Like I don't know. Like I like to watch poker in the background. Sometimes I have it on. I'm like, oh, what just happened? Like you know? this show, just noise. Yeah, and it's just noise. There's <laughs> <laughs> some loud noise, but it's noise. You know, I, I don't know. I just, I, it just appeals to me more like I really enjoy the WSOP streams when they're just played from start to finish you know I, I, just a preference but yeah it's like more like you're watching a TV episode when it's ap- edited like that yeah well it's going to debut on Monday July 29th and new episodes every Monday thereafter you do need a Poker Go subscription that, you know is that why you're not watching it Mike you're not going to pay the 20 bucks a month for Poker I, Go I, I think I have at least two Poker Go subscriptions running currently. <laughs> I, I need to figure out my email situation with the other one, actually. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, I'll definitely be tuning in in Poker News. We'll do weekly recaps where we offer some of the highlights and biggest hands. I, I'm pretty excited about it. I do jo- enjoy High Stakes Poker, and it will be <laughs> Season 13. All right, before we wrap up this episode, I want to give a shout-out to Connor Richards. We love him, right? Hey, He's still Connor, for both of you guys. Dog, yeah. He has his own poker news show, Life Outside Poker, and he actually recently did a sit-down with 888 Poker Ambassador Ian Simpson, who uh, I've seen playing a lot on 888 under Simpioni, I think is, is his name there. Uh, and it was a really good conversation, and once again, wanted to just give you a little preview, a little taste of what you can expect. Check it out. 
How long have I been in poker? Like 12 years now. I've seen it done badly. I've seen people get wins and then set it on fire. I've seen people save up, jump into big tournaments, start losing, chase their losses, borrow money. I've seen some absolute horror stories and it is to be avoided. Poker isn't going anywhere. If you're excited about a 1K event that's happening in the, in the capital city of your country and a thousand bucks is too much for you, don't play it. Like, I'm an ambassador. I want you to play cards, but I don't want you to burn your money. Like, play the satellites, save up money, play very, very responsibly, sell action, do what you have to do. But there's always going to be another tournament. Like, no matter how good you think this tournament's going to be, there's another one. Don't worry about it. Don't get the FOMO. Like, FOMO is a big deal because we're in Vegas right now. So yeah. everyone back home is looking at everyone on Instagram posting, ah, here's $10,000 and here's my tournament buying receipt. And yeah, it's the main and it's exciting. But keep yourself humble. Play what, play what you can afford to play and just be so cautious with money because I've seen the horror stories out there and what it can do to people when it goes wrong. And it's really saddening when it happens. All right, so there you have it. If you want to see the whole interview with Connor Richards interviewing 888 Poker Ambassador Ian Simpson, check it out on the Poker News YouTube channel. Uh, Connor might be back in the studio a little bit. Mike, aren't you like going to the Bahamas or, or something here soon? Yeah, but uh, aren't you uh, also leaving at a similar time? We're going to do the thing with the thing and the yeah, stuff and the stuff. Yeah, the thing and the thing and the, and the stuff and the stuff. Yeah. I, but I think it like because you're going to go back somewhere, but I think it just works that we're not missing anything. Like yeah, I don't record. think any of us are missing anything, are we? No, I don't know. I'm going home for Labor Day, but I should be back to do this. Yeah, my first instinct was say, "When's Labor Day again?" <laughs> I don't know. Later. Yeah, later. It's it's yeah. so weird to think because uh, we're less than a week removed from the WSOP being over since we're re when we're recording this. And I don't know. I, I feel like I'm just coming out of the haze. I'm not, if you I'm, will, I'm still like my levels are low. My levels are low, <laughs> you know? It's hard to get back into real life, get back into your routine and everything. And it's still so hot here in Vegas. That's true. So. The heat, it's excessive. Yes. <laughs> it's so much. I'm so sweating just sitting here. No, it's literally <laughs> bananas. You walk outside, you're just like, ah, why? Why have you done this? <laughs> well, one big change is that we are back to one episode per week. We were doing two during the WSOP, but now that that's died down, we're going to go back to our usual release on Fridays at 8 a.m. Pacific time. You can also catch the audio-only version on any major podcast hosting platform. I'm Chad Holloway, Kyna Richards, Mike Holtz. We'll be back next week. <laughs> what? That's what? not her name. Oh, what is Richards? Connor, Richards? Um, oh, yeah. Connor we're yeah. getting Connor, married. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations on the nuptials. I can't wait till Connor England is here uh, with us yeah, next time. Yeah, it's going to be sick. <laughs> Try again. Do it one more yeah. time. Until then, we'll keep a seat open for you. Yeah.